Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, welcome to session two of, or rather part two of session two of Agave Renaissance. And, and tonight we're honored and privileged to have Jesus Garcia of Mission Garden and uh, the Arizona, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum with us tonight to talk about. I think, well, I think will be a really nice personal um, accounting and approach to uh, a presentation on, on his experience in you know, where he grew up in Northern Sonora and uh, in Bacanora and, and those kinds of things. And before I introduce him formally, uh, real quick, just some some protocols that we want to we want to get across before we get started. Um, to remind you that you know for the best viewing experience, please select the speaker view at the top right of the Zoom window, so that the person who's speaking is right in front of you. Um, and please keep your audio muted during the tasting, so that all participants can clearly hear the speakers. I'm sure that we're all experienced enough with Zoom to know that if there's a lot of background noise, it can really get in the way of the entire event. So please keep yourself muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand option to raise your hand and that's in the gestures menu. So it's not in the chat. We're asking people not to use the chat because uh, it's, it's just, we have people behind the scenes sort of taking um, taking your questions and comments from the raised hand option, and then I will get those forwarded to me, and hopefully I can absorb those and, and get them to the speaker or to the conversation uh, in the best possible way. So that's in the reactions menu again at the bottom of your screen. So click on reactions and then raise your hand and somebody will attend to you. Um, there's also the option of if you're called upon, um, uh, we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question and uh, and then remute yourself afterwards. Um, lastly, if you didn't purchase tastings uh, for tonight's event from Hotel Congress, please feel free to go into your own cupboards and, and, and get a bottle of agave spirits out of there and join us for tastings. Um, so feel free to partake with the Nagave spirits that you may have at your house, and then feel free to join in the conversation. And if you'd still like to purchase the spirits from this tasting after tonight, and you might be inspired to do so, um, they're still available through Hotel Congress's bottle shop. And that's that. And at this point, let me go ahead and introduce Jesus. Jesus Garcia was born and raised in Magdalena de Quino, Sonora, which is what, less than an hour south of Nogales? It's about an hour south of Nogales, something like that. Since 1991, he's been associated with the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, where he is a conservation research associate, teaching natural history and cultural programs throughout Southern Arizona and Northern Sonora. He holds a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology with a minor in cultural anthropology. He's been director of the Kino Heritage Fruit Trees Project for over 15 years. He's also a co-chair and board member and collaborator with Friends of Tucson's Birthplace and the Mission Garden. He's been doing that for over a decade now. His many interests include conservation biology, art, cultural ecology, regional languages, regional music, and gardening. And on a personal note, I just want to honor the friendship that we've had over the years. I met Jesus in 2008. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to, to talk to him, um, to garner his knowledge, uh, to experiment with him, to get his advice on all kinds of things. Um, he's really one of the luminaries in the region, if you ask me. Uh, and with that, Jesus, let's turn it over to you. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Doug. It's great. Yes, great, uh, great group of people here. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, again, a uh, privilege to be part of this group of people, just like yesterday, Susie and Paul presenting an amazing, pres uh, amazing talk and uh, presenting their, their side of the story, which is absolutely fascinating and inspiring. 
And also, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, to a lot of the principal instigators, I would say, starting with Gary Nabhan and Wendy Hudson, and of course, uh, the fish, <laughs> the fish uh, Susie and Paul, uh, for being uh, the inspiration uh, in many ways to get us involved into this. And I will be, going, I will be doing a um, fairly personal story also, because I would like to thank my father uh, who was probably my main um, source of knowledge, information, and inspiration to do what I'm doing now and just kind of continuing this traditional knowledge that has increased quite dramatically in, in, in the last few years. And uh, we're going to be doing three parts. So I'm going to try to do a, a quick uh, story, personal story of my upbringing and living in Sonora with the concept of Bacanora and showing you a few of the uh, aspects of how people make Bacanora and the spirits in Sonora, but also we're going to be doing some tastings. Uh, we're going to take a little break to do a little tasting in between, and then we're going to be also answering questions. As you know, yesterday, a, a lot of very interesting um, stuff comes up when people have questions or comments and, and the conversation expands into, into other areas. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and uh, start uh, quickly with the, um, I think uh, I'm here to be a host. Um, do, uh, I, I, seems like I am disabled as a host. Um, Anna, I don't know if I can be a host. Should be good there now. Jesus. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay. So, well, uh, I'm going to go quickly because I have a lot of photos and a lot of stuff to talk about. And hopefully uh, as the conversation continues, uh, many of you, of course, uh, have been quite involved in, in this. You are familiar with the vocabulary and other things. Uh, we don't want to get too uh, elaborate in some things that have been already said or things that will be uh, eventually part of the presentations in the future. So I'm just going to kind of uh, jump through those um, uh, conversations and vocabulary and other things just for the sake of uh, continuing. Because if some people are new to this, it's always good to listen to some things again because you kind of reaffirm the knowledge. So. Uh, I'm calling this uh, concept of kind of hands-on approach because uh, one thing would be read scientific papers or academic, pa academic papers, watch documentaries or movies about this traditional knowledge, but another thing is actually doing it. As we mentioned yesterday uh, when Susie and Paul were talking about, a lot of these projects are very, very hard work, a lot of hard work, multiple hours, multiple days. And, and, and that, I think, is another aspect of really doing conservation um, hands-on, uh, literally by, by doing it. So it's important to um, uh, keep that in mind, and that's what we're hoping. So I'm going to do a quick little intro uh, to uh, mention uh, just bringing you from the big picture to the low picture, to the smaller picture here in the Sonoran Desert. And uh, we all hear about Mesoamerica. but. Uh, this new concept that Gary and many other anthropologists in the past have coined recently, uh, the concept of arid America. Uh, you could refer to it as the greater Southwest. Uh, some people say, oh, you go from Durango, Colorado to Durango, Mexico, from Las Vegas, New Mexico to Las Vegas, Nevada. You kind of get the idea of the greater Southwest. Um, but uh, from the ecological point of view, calling it arid America, or Arido America in Spanish, is quite interesting to, to differentiate these cultures from Mesoamerica, which is incredibly rich. Uh, in Mexico, often you would hear the word La Gran Chichimeca, uh, which has a more of a cultural and linguistic and, and, and people point of view than an ecological, environmental, ecosystem type of uh, approach. But this puts us into the, um, uh, the concept where we're heading to. So we're heading into a region that we are in the, some people call this the Southwest. Like I said, I often call this the Northwest. Uh, it's all in the eye of the beholder. And, and, and we are in the Northwest of Irish America. So, um, and uh, also to bring the concept of this region of Chihuahua, which we're gonna start tasting as Otol very soon. Um, this whole region, uh, if we look at here, the, uh, the Hohokam region that Susie and Paul um, talked about yesterday, and uh, we're even missing the Trincheras culture, which would, be, which would be just south of the Hoho coming into Sonora. But then you have, look at the Mogollon and the Anasazi above. But the Mogollon region, uh, the center there, you can see Paquimé. And uh, the reason I bring up Paquimé is because uh, it's just an amazing place to understand prehistoric cultures. And if you've never been to Paquimé, highly recommend it. It's one of the most 
well care and, uh, and uh, curated archaeological site in northern Mexico that uh, gives us uh, an insight of the prehistory of the region. And of course, the reason I bring up Paquimé is because on the last trip, actually just, just uh, a year ago or so, uh, in the way back, uh, I always like to go and visit those roasting pits in Paquimé. Uh, those are some of those uh, excavated uh, uh, areas that Charles de Peso did. Um, and those pits are quite big and uh, they resemble very much the ones in Southern Mexico. Uh, many of them are lined with rocks and quite big. Some of those are probably 10 to 15 feet, if not 20 feet across, um, and quite deep too, about 10 feet deep or so. And there are two or three together in the same spot. So this tells us that, and then of course, look at the amount of rocks on the side there. So there's all this evidence uh, in ancient culture that these things were, were happening there. And then uh, of course, for those of you that are new to this, uh, when we talk about Soto, uh, we can't really call it mezcal. And, uh, Coming from a completely different plant, um, I have to say a little disclaimer that, uh, as I went, I, I will mention that my father was a mezcalero. Um, I remember him saying that if you try to make uh, spirits out of sotol, it wasn't very good. That was his take. Um, again, he was making uh, mezcal in the 1930s and 40s in the Rio Sonora region, but when you have all these amazing agaves in central Sonora, the Sonora River Valley, uh, uh, having Sotol, try to make mezcal out of Sotol or spears out of Sotol, it was a lower quality uh, product, I guess. And I always remember my father saying that Sotol wasn't that great. Now things have changed. I'll be curious to see how people really do uh, the process of Sotol to make it as it is now and it's become a commercial uh, product. So uh, for now, uh, I'm gonna pass the microphone to uh, Doug for just a little bit. So we can have a little taste of Sotol and talk a little bit about what we're gonna taste today. And then when I come back to uh, the Bacanora story um, to uh, kind of dive into a little bit of my story and the story of uh, Bacanora. Yeah, so my role here real quick is, is just to give you the kind of the, the, the specs actually on, on, on spirits. And so the first one is Sotol. So those of you who purchased uh, a bottle of Sotol, um, Actually, those who didn't, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to, to give some information about the Sotol. Uh, it, it's, it's made in Aldama, Chihuahua, which is just north of Chihuahua City in Chihuahua, of course. Uh, made by Eduardo Ruelas, who is a major Sotol maker. He produces for various brands that are exported to the United States. Um, in this case, the species is Dasilirian wheelerai, which I think is probably the most common species of Sotol that's that makes Sotol as a distillate. Um, there are, I think, 14 or 15 or 16 species of, of Dasilirian, and a handful of those, four or five, tend to make up the lion's share of Sotol distillates. And far and away, I think the most important one of those is Wheelerai. We have plenty of Wheelerai, by the way, right here in Tucson. You can find it all over town. So this is Desert Spoon. I think uh, many of us know the plant well or if we don't know the plant by name, if one would show you a picture of it, you would, you would certainly recognize it. Um, in terms of the production process, Sotol tends to be produced, uh, artisanal Sotol anyway, tends to be produced in much the same way as artisanal mezcals, uh, including Bacanora in the North. In this case, um, it is, it is um, it's cooked in a conical oven, kind of like the one that, that Jesus just showed you, a rock-lined or volcanic rock-lined oven. Um, uh, Gerardo Royalis is a pretty big producer, so his oven is, I think it fits 10 tons of Sotol hearts in it, so it's pretty big. Um, and those Sotol hearts, once they're harvested, are, are cooked or roasted in that pit for about 48 hours using mesquite and oak, um, hardwood, uh, comes out of that oven and then is milled, that is it's crushed, um, the pulp is crushed, the juice is extracted, the fibers are beat um, by hand, so with, with axes. So it's ex an extremely labor intensive process. It's already labor, it's, in, it's labor intensive from the very get go. 
And this is just, you know, one of the steps in the process that is especially labor intensive. So milled by axe, fermented in wooden vats, kind of like if anybody has visited a Palenque in Oaxaca, you see some sort of some pine or some cypress wooden vats. The wooden vats at Ruelas' distillery look much like those uh, 300 liter vats, something like that, softwood vats. Fermented for, depending on the season, between five days and 20 days. Um, things ferment much slower in the winter time. So depending upon the season, you know, that will determine the fermentation time. And then once it's fermented, it's distilled in copper alembic stills for, well, it's distilled twice. So it does two runs. And um, in terms of flavors, I don't know, Sotol, Sotol is interesting. I could talk a long, sort of too, too long about um, diversity in Sotol, but this is, this is sort of a grassland so tall. So it's not low desert so much, but it's also not a mountain so tall, uh, which can have some pine notes and, and coniferous kinds of notes. I think the grassland so tolls are really a, a really nice flavor expression of that Chihuahuan desert, kind of five to 6,000 feet above sea level, desert grassland, oak savanna kind of terroir. Um, so it's very earthy, some leathery notes in there, kind of wet desert dirt. So, you know, if you imagine, I don't know, desert soils just after a monsoon rain, that's kind of a flavor note that you might pick up in this sort of a sotol. But also there's this kind of body-wise or texture-wise, there's a nice deep sort of custard maybe kind of note to it as well in this case as sort of a tropical fruit. It's kind of a jackfruit, I think. So if you imagine juicy fruit gum, that's jackfruit. And I find that to be one of the, one of the flavors that you, you, you find in this particular Sotol. So that's a cinch, that's, that's like sort of the bare bones description of this particular distillate. Hey, Seuss, what do you think? Yes, very good. I had, I had a little taste yesterday too, so I had to taste it beforehand, but yes, very good. So uh, now let's, let's dive into um, uh, the Bacanora story um, and, and, and kind of how it connects to us right here in Tucson and, 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 and to many of us. Of course, in my, in my case, it's a personal story, but how it connects many of us in one way or another, we have um, become part of this, uh, of this uh, interesting journey. So first of all, uh, again, just for the sake of some fun here, uh, we're going to uh, start with, uh, with a, Spanish a Spanish lesson that uh, those of you who have traveled to Oaxaca in southern Mexico, of course, uh, I, I, I couldn't pass barring their motto, this, this story that you hear everywhere you go in Oaxaca and southern Mexicans. For those of you who don't speak Spanish, this is your great opportunity at least to learn some Spanish by the end of the evening. And uh, again, para todo mal mezcal y para todo bien también. So for everything that goes wrong, you drink mezcal and for everything that goes well as well. Simple as that. So it shows the, the culture of mezcal uh, that it is it's not just to get drunk and, and you know, and, and, and have a, a, a college party or anything. But again, the other party says, y si no hay remedio, litro y medio. So if, if it doesn't work out or if the remedy doesn't work, we'll just drink a liter and a half. Uh, I mean, it is a simple um, play on words, but it just reflects so much uh, the reality of mezcal drinking in the culture of Southern Mexico. And, and I feel like, yeah, we can definitely borrow that from, <laughs> from the South. And uh, what I would like to also mention, uh, this is a good opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, Southern Mexico versus uh, the Sonoran Desert. When I first heard Wendy Hogson saying, you know, how she talked about all this incredibly uh, diversity of uh, species and, and some of them variations and, uh, and, and subspecies and um, either varieties that even haven't been quite described yet. Uh, when she said, hey, we can rival Oaxaca. <laughs> we can rival Southern Mexico in certain ways. Hey, I think we can, those of us, it kind of gave me a, an inspiration to really discover more of what we have and is buried in history, is buried in 
literally in some cases in the ground, but is buried in the past. And I feel like this is a great opportunity to uh, bring that up, uh, the, bring that back, uh, the concept of understanding our agaves, our diversity in the culture of agave here. So um, let's uh, then quickly, I don't spend too much time on this, but uh, we, we uh, a few people have asked in previous uh, um, presentation uh, how the word mezcal is used interchangeable, whether you're referring to the plant or we're referring to the food or you're referring to the drink, the spirit. So uh, the bottom line is that the word mezcal comes from uh, uh, the concept that is cooked agave. And particularly when it's you know in an underground hole or any type of cooking underground system where the agave gets cooked or steamed. So that's the beginning of that. So the different ramifications afterwards, we have named several species of agaves in the region as mezcal because either because people were making mezcal, they were using them for eating or for other things. So then the word propagates as a as a common name, and it can be confusing for, especially for somebody who does speak, doesn't speak Spanish and, 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 and or, or is not familiar with the scientific um, uh, way of uh, whether it's going to be a scientific name or a common name. And so, yeah, bear with us as we use interchangeable sometimes the word mezcal, and then sometimes people in English spell it with an S, in Spanish spell it with, an, with a Z. And so anyway, so that's just to give you an idea. And then the concept that all these spirits are really mezcales, whether it's tequila, bacanora, lechuguilla, or raicilla, um, or other that we sometimes don't know, um, they're all mezcales, but it, then it comes down to the species of agave, the region, and the actual maker, the actual um, location where it's made. So that's again, another confusing thing for people uh, whether tequila or mezcal and, and the concept of commercialism and brand names and, and, and rights, et cetera. So it is confusing, but uh, it's been talked about and I'm sure it will in other, in other presentations uh, clarifying those ideas. So I'd like to start with uh, um, the story of my father. Uh, since I was a kid uh, uh, growing up in, in Magdalena, Sonora, uh, I was just constantly bombarded in, in a regular basis with the the concept of uh, mezcal making. Uh, my father, as a young man, uh, he, he grew up in the Sonoran River Valley. And when he was very, very young, he was raised in, in a place called Rancho La Montosa, which is a, in the road between the Sonoran River Valley and the Babispe River Valley. So if you travel from Babiacura to Moctezuma region, there is this ranch called La Montosa. And my grandmother was the, the person who took care of all the cowboys there. So my father grew up there as a kid. And once he was a young man, he and his brother and his uncle would basically go to the mountains and make uh, mezcal. And obviously they were making bacanora, they were using more like, most, most likely as they still do in that region, a lot of angustifolia. And uh, so by the time I was born, of course, this was long after my father left that activity. Uh, but he will talk a lot about the, the vocabulary, the story how it was made, uh, because mezcal has always been part of my family. My father always had a bottle of mezcal it's hidden in his, uh, you know, uh, closet sometime, and he would have a shot once in a while. And, and so I grew up uh, being exposed to this. And so I would hear stories, too, that particularly the, the ones that stuck with me were the stories of the concept of illegal mezcal making, because at that time it was completely illegal. They had to be hiding. Anybody who was making mezcal had to be hiding in the mountains. And everybody, something that ever since I was a kid, uh, I learned this word, la acordada. La acordada was the rural police that would come to small towns and rural areas. And if you were caught making mezcal, in some cases they would actually hang you in the spot. That's how penalized. Uh, the prohibition concept of, in the 1930s in the United States, it also spilled all over in Mexico as well until recent, I believe until even the early 80s. Uh, some people know uh, the actual dates for that. So Mexico was also going through a prohibition um, uh, culture at that time, but the mezcal making in those activities continued and many, many people would do it because it was part of the local economy. And the interesting thing uh, that I used to hear from my father was that um, they would bring it from the mountains into the towns, in this case, the town of Babiacora, Sonora, where he grew up. Um, they would bring him at night in burros. They would load him with those square cans 
tin cans uh, and they would bring you know several gallons at night. And it turns out that my grandmother was the person who sold the bacanora uh, to the locals. And they would come at three or four in the morning, particularly on weekends, and they would knock at the door at three in the mornings and asking, Carlotita, do you have, tienes trago? And they said that my mother, my grandmother would shout from inside, tienes casco, meaning, do you have a container? Said, yes, okay. So, and then they would get the container, she would serve it and she would get paid. So everything under the water and only and what does what does tienes trago mean no tienes casco no but you said tienes trago oh tienes trago of course the that would be the person outside asking do you have anything to drink essentially yeah, right. and you didn't have to say sometimes even that i mean uh, that you would know what they wanted if somebody's knocking at three in the morning but so so that goes to show you the intricate culture of of my family uh in a in a, in a regular um uh, uh, style. So because of that uh, concept of growing up with my brothers and my father always talking about and trying to explain how it was made. Uh, one day, this is about 20 years ago, I sat on the kitchen table and I got my journal and I started drawing every step of the uh, mezcal making uh, story. So he was across me on the table and he just kept telling me this is how it's done. So I have a little close up of the journal here. And I started drawing from the, the Orno, the, the underground uh, pit, to the when the agaves start um, bolting and how you castrate them, how you cut the leaves, how you transport them in a burro, how you uh, use an axe in a piece of an orqueta or a big fork of a mesquite, a very large mesquite fork, where you would mash the cooked um, heads of the agave, las cabezas or las piñas, and then how it was fermented in another container, which we wasn't, think about it, in the 1930s, they wouldn't have plastic containers or even uh, metal containers as easy or available as today. So the, the fermenting bat that you were talking about a while ago for, for Sotol would have been another hole in the ground, another hole dug in the ground lined with rocks and lined with very fine um, mud. So the agave, the, what we call the site, which would be the, uh, the mix of agave, mushed agave ready to ferment, would be in this hole in the ground, and they call the barranco. And then he tells me about the distillation process, the, 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 the top of the thing is called el sombrero and la culebra, and then how it's uh, distilled and how many times. So that was, this is a long time ago. I was just absorbing all the story of how he um, kept explaining, but all this was just in words. All it was just in these drawings. And for years, my brothers and I would say, hey, someday we should try to do this. Uh, you know, because he kept talking. We all feel so familiar and so clear about how it was done and then how it was stored, et cetera, et cetera, that we felt like we could do it. But we, we never done it. <laughs> we, we hadn't done it. And so what happens is in, in, in later years, I start traveling to all those communities from Baviacora to Bacanora. This is the town of Bacanora, Sonora beautiful little town in the Bavispe River Valley. And uh, here is where Bacanora comes from. And for those of you that wonder, what does Bacanora mean? Well, it means because it comes from the town called Bacanora, just like you hear tequila and other, and other places. So this was probably one of the most popular places at the time that one of the good stuff would be, uh, one of the good you know, products would be coming from these places. And nowadays you go to Bacanora and of course uh, it, it's a, it's, it's not uh, as um, it, it's not prohibited anymore. So now it's open. It, it's, it's a sign of pride. Uh, when you are welcome to the central part of Bacanora, you have a monument. It's a bronze monument of two men making Bacanora with the traditional way. Uh, you have the the 200 liter drums, the sombrero uh, with the, the steel and the the spiral, the culebra. A man standing the, the dripping spot there. Another man is using an ax, uh, mushing the agave heads in there. So it's a sense of pride now. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sense of place that uh, depicts the culture of the town. In, in the recent years, uh, many people have uh, uh, basically uh, figured out that, hey, you, we can start planting this. Those people who have land uh, throughout the Rio Sonora, the Rio Babispe, farther down in Sonora, People have figured out that, hey, I can start planting these agaves. As you can see, they're kind of skinny and gustufolia. They have very uh, skinny um, shape. 
uh, the harvesting is quite similar. The tools sometimes have to be a little different from the south. The heads are not that big. And then the same way, um, a few years ago, when we first started the Agave Heritage Festival, um, our friend uh, Bill Steen and Gary Nabhan, of course, put out this little publication with these amazing photos. When I saw that burro loaded with those cabezas to be uh, transported, it just immediately remembered my father. So this is exactly what my father told me, and that's, the, that's exactly how you transport the cabezas, uh, because we're talking wild harvested agave. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, in a small scale, you would have a very small orno. So it's an underground pit lined with rocks. And depending on the amount of heads that you would have, sometimes you would cut them in half. But one thing I always remember my father saying, you are going to put the fire in that oven for as long as you need. And that might be three or four hours or five or six hours until those rocks are white. They have to be white. And we're talking six hours of fire. And that would mean a truckload of mesquite wood that sometimes you may have to uh, use for that. And of course, nowadays, uh, this has come from the, I think from uh, the Tepua um, uh, brand from Babiacora. They're using now stainless steel, a lot more sophisticated, somewhat uh, larger scale distillation process. But I'll show you a couple of other very, very simple um, um, uh, trend, as they call it, or the uh, uh, mechanisms. The one on the left here, you can see that it's actually the sombrero, the actual uh, area where the, um, the uh, vapors uh, start uh, get going into the spiral for the uh, serpentine for condensation is made out of wood. It's a piece of wood that could be either palm or, or something or a hollow log where uh, that's where it has to be removable because once you have um, evaporated and distilled most of the fermented juices, the site, you have to clean that barrel and then put new uh, material to do another cuelgue or another uh, batch. So look at the right, very ingenious. This comes from Alamos Sonora from a place called Real de Alamos. It's a fairly new operation quite elaborate and, and they seem to be doing quite well. So the, the actual olla where they're cooking the agave has a tilting mechanism that once you're done with that cookout, you tilt the whole container and clean it up very easily. So you can see how these signs of industrialization and more practical um, approaches are taking place, therefore making the operations a little more swift and, and easy too. So here is a, a larger view of that, those are two uh, stills working there. Uh, you will hear the word for those of you that might have heard the word alambique. Uh, that's more of the alambique style, which is an Arabic style system that prevails in this area. And you can look by the size that is quite big. And um, obviously when something is being cooked, which can be cooked for five or six or 10 hours, the maestro mezcalero is always there. And sometimes you may have to be there all night taking care of that. Uh, here's a Possibly what Susie mentioned yesterday, this very likely agave desert possibly this was uh, taken near Magdalena, where some of these uh, old hidden alambiques have been. Once uh, I started, you know, getting more curious about the stories that my father told me, then my brother said, hey, there's some areas here in the mountains near Magdalena where we can find some old Mayas or hornos where people were making mezcal illegally hiding in the mountains. So we went and looked for them. In the middle of nowhere, we would find this um, uh, remnants of, in this case, uh, often people call Maya when it's more of an open, uh, open hole. Um, and the hornos are the ones a little more constricted and more narrow. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we go on. Look at this mountain here. In the middle of nowhere, look at the very center of the picture. Look what this oven was. So you had to bring the wood, you had to bring water, you had to bring uh, um, the, the maguey's uh, all to that area to hide in these little ravines so you could make your, your bacanora. We're talking about this one, this, this uh, orno is about easily, a 60, easily 50 or 60 years old. And you can see how uh, small it is. Uh, the, the mouth is very narrow, but the bottom is wide. So this is an approach that one man uh, could make a batch of maybe a truckload of agaves or maybe several horses or mules or donkeys worth um, and without having too much help. Uh, we're used to seeing in Oaxaca and other places 
humongous ornos that take five or six or 10 people loading and unloading and all that. It's a lot of work. This style is very efficient. One person can do the work. Uh, the distillation process is very simple to do with 200 liter drums when you have the olla for cooking and then you have the condensation uh, container next door, um, very simple. And here's an example where the orno is. Uh, here, my brother and this man, the, the mezcalero, are uncovering, this is of course dormant for the season. Uh, they use the hood of a truck to cover the mouth of the orno. And when they open it, you can see the hole. Uh, inside, you would go in there and it's probably about seven feet deep. And even though the top might be about four feet wide, the bottom was about six feet wide. So just to give you an idea, and they would say sometimes they would put two truck loads of mesquite wood for a proper firing. Um, that gives you an idea to how, how many times it's been fired. And of course, once you have the agaves fired, uh, um, the, the angustifolias and the desert eyes and a lot of the local varieties near Magdalena, um, um, they're not very big. Um, so that's what reason often people call them lechuguilla. The word lechuguilla comes from the word lechuga. Lechuga is a lettuce. So these are not very big agaves. They, they resemble small lettuce. I mean, compared to a typical agave farther south, these are lettuce looking agaves. The rosettes are very small. And the head once is, uh, you know, clean and, and, and fire is very small. It's literally the size of a, you know, ball, something like this. But if it's properly done, the right time is incredibly sweet, incredibly delicious. Um, years later, uh, when I started getting into this, that I was able to taste those uh, wild harvested agaves and had a taste. 30 years later, 30 years later, it just, it was a, 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 a taste of my childhood, getting that agave taste with the sweetness because as a kid, it, it, it's candy, that's what it is. So on the bottom, you can see the orqueta, uh, of course, uh, with sediment because of the rain there, but it has a, a tin, um, kind of a tin, piece of tin on the bottom, uh, obviously had to be really clean and washed. And then on the right, I have a picture from Alamo, Sonora. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not Alamo, it's in the Rio Sonora, it's in the, a place called uh, Rancho La Martina, where in one of our trips, uh, actually the, the locals demonstrate how to do it and they uh, get some of the tourists uh, to get a hand of mashing um, the agave heads. It's a lot of work, a lot of work you can see, and they still use axes. And they use the blunt part of the ax to mash the the um, uh, the agaves until they are almost mushy and they're so sweet and there's so much sugar that bees were crawling all over the place and your hands were sticky all over by handling the tools and just being there that goes to show you how amazing it is as Susie showed yesterday of course I have my own set of pictures in Magdalena right on the streets people from southern Mexico bring truckloads of wonderful great southern probably Americanas, Salmianas, I don't know what they are, big, huge agaves, and they come and sell them on the streets and you can buy them. They're expensive, about five bucks a piece. These little pieces are really delicious, well-cooked. You can buy them in the street in Magdalena and just enjoy them. I mean, this is again, another flavor that many Mexicans, you don't have to be uh, a lover of uh, spirits or anything. This is just something that everybody enjoys this amazing flavor of sweetness. And as you've seen before too, Gary has talked a lot about this. Gary and Bill Steen um, have talked a lot about how here in Tucson, in the 1800s, late 1800s, you could find a mezcal bacanora labeled right here, produced in Tucson. And how they say in the label, el cocimiento del licor bajo esta marca se usan únicamente las cabezas sazonas. They are saying that the cooking for these agaves um, uh, was very particular by using uh, uh, matured heads, agave heads. So they, that's part of the, uh, um, the label there. And uh, then uh, just to kind of start uh, the process of how I got more involved into and inspired, particularly this picture is actually from Desert Botanical Gardens many years ago by walking around the peoples and, and um, in plants, a trail, which is fascinating. I see this little trinchera in a little ravine with a few agave murphias blooming there. And that was really the beginning of uh, this inspiration that you can grow agaves literally everywhere in your backyard, anywhere, and create this uh, 
trinchera style rock pile uh, story that Tuzi and Paul was, were talking about. And you can reproduce that fairly easy with these agaves. And so that inspired me to, uh, when we started at the Mission Garden, when we started uh, growing non-native and native plants um, to basically create this oven that my father always talked about. And actually Doug came and helped, I remember, and many other people came and helped digging the hole. Again, all I was being just driven by the knowledge that my father had told me and other people from his um, contemporaries who tell this is how it's done and this is how it looks and this is how you put the rocks. And it was several days and weeks of work, but we did it. And ever since for the last five years, we've been cooking agaves there. So, and we're hoping maybe to do some in the near future. So we started doing trincheras, rock piles outside and inside, creating this system of in the ground nursery of agaves. As we get to know from uh, researchers and practitioners in Southern Mexico, how resilient in, in, in these plants are that you can plant them in, in tiny little uh, pots first, and then you can transfer them to the ground and you can junk them out of the ground and put them somewhere else. So it's a nursery style that keeps going. So then we started talking to, to Sonans and many of them have agaves in their front yards. Uh, they got excited about our project and they would say, hey, I will donate my blooming agave this year. Uh, for the project and we would cook them. So that gave us the opportunity to experiment uh, at the different stages and different species of agaves we can find in Tucson to cook them. And we've been doing that for a few years. So I go and collect them and it's a lot of work. Doug and I have spent hours and hours trying to get an Americana on top of a truck and we had to break it in pieces in order to be able to put it on top of the truck. Um, so again, that actually, gives you, yeah. Actually, actually, I, I remember to push it out of the ground with the truck itself oh, you're and, right. <laughs> and, and, dent, and denting my bumper in the process. <laughs> so, so that goes to show you the passion that uh, we've had to Literally. experiment and have the opportunity to, to learn because oh, things that went wrong were very much amazing learning experiences. So yes, uh, for the last five years, we've been firing this oven, experimenting with different ways, the wood, the amount of time, the species of agave that we've tried, um, uh, figure out the temperatures um, and having fun in the process, gathering a few friends, drinking a few uh, spirits um, while uh, things are happening because sometimes you have to fire that oven for at least two or three hours, at least to get a decent firing. And then you know, it, was, it was it was based on that experience of digging the pit with you at the Mission Garden that I went straight home and dug my own pit <laughs> with some friends, including Paco Cantu, who's with us tonight. Um, and it's it's yeah, I mean I've used that pit several times on Sotol and Agave both. Uh, anybody can do it. it. I think it took us half a day to dig that pit and actually line it with rock. Brian Eichhorst helped as well, by the way. Um, so this is something everyone can do. I mean, it's like, it's, what is it? A meter deep and a meter wide, right? Something like that. Just about. And I think it's, it's one of those things that you can do it almost at the, at the level that you can, or, or you are able to. Um, I've been just curious about now recently trying to do another one more like the Southern Mexico style, but in bowl or yeah. what they call Maya more open. It's a little extra work to do the process. And the reason I was very, um, adamant about doing this style, the, what people call the Sonoran style uh, roasting pit, is because one person can do the whole work in very short amount of time. Uh, uh, throwing the fire, um, preparing the heads, throwing them and covering it. I'm using a side of a washer machine to cover the hole. And then we put rocks on top, uh, put dirt on top of it, literally five to 10 minutes to do that and it's done. So in the, in the meantime, uh, the fire is going inside. Uh, I mean, the coals are working, cooking. So we have 24 hours or 30 hours to wait for that agave to get cooked. So we have the opportunity to show that the byproduct of this is all the leaves that you cut out of the agave, which is called jimar. Jimando is to cut all the leaves of the agave and that becomes a byproduct. And of it's course, as part of my uh, passion, it's been also learning that agaves have been used for fiber for a long time and many species uh, have different characteristics and qualities, but this is another opportunity for us to, this is, could be a whole other presentation uh, on, on getting the fibers and the articles you can do. We make rope 
uh, we can make sandals, you can make bags, you can make all kinds of brooms, etc. So this is another opportunity to exploit the other side of the agaves for arts and crafts and materials that are also kind of forgotten in this area and could be revived. Uh, for instance, this is a, a nice piece of rope that I made out of agave fibers. Um, quite interesting. Uh, the, again, the traditional knowledge for this is being lost, but we also try to keep this alive and do that because it's a whole other part of it. So once the agaves are done, let's say two days later or three days later, uh, literally, you can leave them there. Doesn't matter a long time. They'll be fine. Even a week, they can be there and get them out and they'll be fine. Sometimes three or four day, days later, they're still hot. Open up the hole. It takes 10 minutes or less to open up the hole. And there you have them. Once in there, uh, you want to look for that smell. You want to look for the color. You want to look for the texture and the taste. And obviously, um, this project that we've been doing is mostly for tasting. Uh, because we, in some cases, we put three different varieties in there that we didn't know how they will turn out. We put some that were matured. We put some that were not matured. Some that we just found and somebody wanted to get rid of them and we just went and cut them. So there's still quite a little bit of uh, experimentation. But the more we've done this, the more we've narrowed down um, the aspects to, to get a better result at the end. So we've been able to share that with people and to taste and enjoy the... Uh, uh, the product of, of what we've done, and we're still in learning stages. I mean, we, we, we have hopefully once uh, things get better after the pandemic, we'll be able to experiment and do more of this. So with that said, uh, uh, that's the end of the uh, um, Bacanora presentation. And now we're going to uh, taste uh, another um, uh, spirit and uh, we'll open it up for questions or comments uh, that this might trigger in your um, let, let, let me let me let me just say a few words about the bacanora and the tasting tonight. Um, there's two more spirits we're tasting. Let, let, let me talk just a, a second about the the bacanora. This is Mazot, the brand Mazot bacanora, imported by Borderland Spirits. Um, again, Mike Hurley's with us tonight. He represents Mazot. Um, it's made in bacanora itself. Jesus showed us some photos of bacanora itself. The welcome sign fields outside the town. Um, those images are, are, are Bacanora. Uh, it's made by, you know, in the South, like in Oaxaca, um, they're called maestros mezcaleros, those who are the masters of the maker, the makers of Bacanora. In the North, in Sonora, they're called maestros vinateros, because vinata is, is the local word for a distillery. So Maestros Vineteros Manuel in Sinaway Chacon from the Chacon family, although the brand or the business is really owned by their mother, um, Emilia Ezre, she's the boss. So if, I mean, we, uh, we talked a little bit, I think last time people talk a lot about women in Mezcal and this is one example of a woman who's quite involved in, in a Mezcal business, uh, Emilia is great. Um, the agave is, well, on the label, it's Agave Pacifica, or those who talk about Bacanora talk about Agave Pacifica. That's really an Agave Angustifolia. For those of us interested in species, um, variety Pacifica. Uh, Angustifolia is the species. And this is cooked in a cylindrical pit. We saw some images of that uh, for kind of like the the Sotol we just had for a couple of days with hardwood, mesquite, and oak. And this one is milled by a descaradora, which is, which is a chip, it's kind of a shredder. So it's a machine that shreds. Uh, this one is fermented in food grade plastic, which is not uncommon in the North. It's not as common elsewhere, although I think it's more common uh, across the country as the years pass. Um, fermented in food grade plastic barrels and distilled twice in copper. And I think, I don't know how many of us have that Bacanor in front of us, but you know, I, I love Mazo because I think it's, it's representative and exemplary both. I mean, it represents Bacanor really well in its flavor profile uh, and it's also just super high quality stuff. And the flavors in Bacanor for me tend to be a little bit lactic, especially on the nose. So there's like a sort of a cheesy kind of note on the nose, a rich cheesy note. Uh, 
and then some florality. In this case, I think there's kind of a sarsaparilla or a root beer sort of flavor note in there as well. Um, it's got a nice mellow citrus note, I think too. And kind of like the Sotol tool, it's got that, uh, maybe this is common to Sotols and agave spirits in general, but that kind of um, tropical fruit or jackfruit, maybe even mango sort of fruit note there as well. So I think the profile really represents Bacanora well. Bacanora, although it's made from Angustifolia, which is the same species, if you remember last time, that makes um, Espadine in, in Oaxaca, I think, you know, when, when you're talking about terroir, you're talking about, you know, production area or region or zone, climates, soils, water, all that stuff, you know, the one factor that's constant is the species, but Bacanoras are very, I think are quite distinct. They're very different from most or all Espadines in Oaxaca or, or any other distillates that's made from the same species in Gustafolia. I think Bacanora has its own signature. So it occupies its own place in the Mezcal universe, uh, which I think is great because it has its own personality, really represents Sonora quite well, I think, in the Mescal world. That's enough of that. Now yeah. we can open it up to discussion and... Yeah, I just say, other... I'd like to say a few a few uh, words uh, just to kind of open it up for a discussion and maybe uh, talk a little bit about part of the culture that is also, I think, important to mention. Um, as we uh, really, really move into this renaissance of, of, of agave, uh, and particularly Bacanora, let's say from Sonora here in Arizona and Tucson and probably around the world to a certain extent, the, the concept that the, the, the mezcal culture within Sonora, it's, it's been so old for a long time. And, but remember that it also hits the, uh, the local economy, uh, El Borrachito del Pueblo, uh, the, you know, the local, uh, uh, the person, uh, the, the local drunk of the town uh, the just anybody the 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 cattleman who uh, or the person who when you go to their house as we were talking about the other day uh, with Susie uh, when you visit somebody uh, the greeting uh, the they you you go into the house and they greet you with a little shot of of bacanora as 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 a, um, as a normal sort of thing and I wanted to mention a few things like uh, you when you invite somebody to your house never never get the bottle out. You go and fill the, the shot out there in the closet and you bring and only bring the shot. <laughs> That's the rule in Sonora. Uh, and when you drink it and, and if the host decides to offer you another one, he will take the little shot and we'll go back to the last corner of the house, fill the shot again and bring it back to you again in the living room. The bottle never, never leaves, never comes to the front because you know what could happen. That's just, just one example. But uh, I wanted to mention a couple other things about the concept that the quality. Ever since I was a kid, I've heard it's this game. It's a game that happens among rancheros and people who drink bacanora or any type of mezcal. Is it good? Where can I find the good one? That's, that's the name of the game. And you may end up getting sometimes even the worst quality that you can imagine because it was cheaper or because it was good, but unless you know the person, if you know the mezcalero, then you may end up getting something good. So that brings us into the concept, like what quality are you getting when you get it from somewhere who, when it's a friend of a friend? And yes, sometimes you can get good stuff if you know the person, but sometimes you may not. Um, nowadays, uh, we can incorporate into the process, uh, the commercialism. So people who don't necessarily make it, but they sell it, so they would buy five gallons and they would make it eight gallons. And then in order to make more money. So the, the, the person who will drink just for the sake of drinking may not care about the quality. But now we have a, a whole new culture of discovering qualities and flavors and, and location and, and uh, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. So those are things that uh, are important to mention. And some of you probably noticed, and I wanted to bring to the attention as Susie said yesterday, I have a couple of capados right here. Uh, Susie was talking about yesterday about castrating the agave. So yes, I've castrated a couple of agaves in the last few weeks and they're somewhere, somewhere near downtown where uh, these are Murphy eyes. 
And uh, that's another concept that I always uh, learned from my father too. Uh, when, when, when the stock is just about one foot or two, three feet, you don't want to let it go beyond that. That's when you castrate them. That's when you cut them. So, and then you go maybe, and this varies from person to person. You go two months later or even six months later, or sometimes a year later, you can go and harvest that agave. And again, scientifically, more people have figured out that the agaves are accumulating sugars, accumulating the carbohydrates. And you would have to do some probably test to figure out when is the best time, what species will take castrating at what time and when you harvest it. Just to give an idea of, of uh, this culture and knowledge that is part of this piling up of details to make good quality spirits. So I'm sure we have some questions or comments or from anybody here, uh, Anna or, uh, or Dagan, if uh, you will get questions from the audience. Uh, let's see. I'm not. Do we have questions, guys? I see one that says, "How many vinatas are registered uh, producing?" Um, I don't. I really don't know that. Uh, you might have some other uh, registered. It's it's a trick. It's a tricky tricky word. Uh, whether you're talking about labels or things that have been exported. So, Doug, you might have a little more insight on that. Well, yeah, uh, you know, I mentioned in that short description of the Bacanora that it's, you know, it's an agave in Gustafolia. And, you know, I certainly can say that, you know, Bacanora um, has its own denomination of origin, so-called. So it has its own sort of legal framework around it, its own governmental or semi-governmental council that tries to govern quality control, production methods, um, uh, and, 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 that's, and that sort of thing to protect producers who are making artisanal bacanora. And it is true that, you know, you should, you must actually, if, if you're gonna certify your distillate as, as bacanora, you have to register your, your distillery, you have to register your vinata. When it comes to number of registered vinatas, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if anybody else has. Mike, you might have uh, a better answer to that than me. Uh, but yeah, part, part, part of the law is that you have to distill Bacanora from Agave and Gustafolia Pacifica. So there's about two and a half different types of registration. One is just registering so that you can make it legally. And there's about 1,500 to 5,000 small scale people doing that. And the other, is almost commercial and and then there's commercial that you could sell in the stores so when i started in 2017 there were 16 uh every time i get online there's another brand i mean there's got to be well over 50 brands now and it's hard to keep up so mm -hmm. so it, it's right. it's reached an explosion in the last year Are you talking it's, to her? Uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Todd's asking if we can explain the difference between Pacifica and Angustifolia, and, and maybe I just did that. Um, Angustifolia is 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 a pretty it's it's a, a, a very common species from Sonora all the way down, perhaps even to Costa Rica. Uh, it, it it does it does extend definitely into Central America, and you know eighty five percent of mescal in Oaxaca is made from Angustifolia, that's Espadine. Um, I talked a little bit about Angustifolia having its different characteristics, its, its different expressions according to region, um, not just region, not just geographic region and climate and whatnot, but also you know, the, the, the human hand, um, which has a role in, in mezcal production. So agave Angustifolia has many, many expressions, both within Oaxaca and beyond Oaxaca for sure. And Pacifica is, I'm not even sure whether botanists would give Pacifica uh, botanical credibility any anymore. I'm not sure, maybe Wendy Hodgson would have something to say about that more than, you know, she might have more to say than, than I could say. 
but um, typically on the bottle, when you see a, like a certified Bacchanora, you, you might see agave and gustifolia, VAR period, you know, variedad or, or, or variety Pacifica. So it's a variety of the species to answer that question. Um, and, 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 and Daya asks whether castrating an agave is a good thing. And maybe that's in the eye of the beholder too, right? <laughs> Jesus, if you're talking about the agave itself, if it's good to castrate it, you know, that plant might tell you no, <laughs> but, but the mezcal producer might have a different comment. Yes, right. and, and of course, that is, again, another issue that um, it, 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 I'll tell you, uh, hopefully won't disappoint you about these things, but that's how it is. Uh, it, it comes the culture, it comes the making, it comes the, the, the money making, the commercialism. And uh, as I was saying earlier, you want to make a high quality product, which all this obviously artisanal. Um, you, you, well, you find the, the species that will be the best in your region. Uh, you're gonna harvest them at the best time. You're gonna harvest them when the when the agaves are matured or starting to bolt. You're gonna process them and cooking them and mixing them properly, and you're gonna get high quality. But it turns out that even when when the quantity is small, you can get a small amount of high quality mezcal. But commercially, it's not gonna be viable because. Uh, unless you make it yourself for yourself. And, and, but if you are a person who's making this for a living, that amount of work of collecting, uh, uh, preparing, cooking, processing, we're talking days and weeks of process to get a small amount of high quality, very high quality, delicious mezcal, it's not viable to sell it. So then the mixing cabezas y colas uh, uh, or, or you know, tails and, 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 and heads to, to expand a, a certain, uh, um, level of alcohol and, and to make a good tasting mezcal to be able to sell and make some money, it is something important. So some mezcaleros that I've talked to, uh, they say, oh, I don't care. I just cut the agaves uh, anytime. As long as they look big enough, I cut them. And, but then they ended up adding sugar. They literally add sugar to the process to make it uh, last, to, to make more of it. Um, also sometimes, um, it's just the quality is not as good. But when you're selling it to, you know, the local rancheros who just want to have some time, a good time, they don't really care about what level. If it wasn't bad, okay, we had a good time. So now that we're moving into this gourmet boutique style of mezcals, so we can be a little more picky about things and, and the quality. And then of course, with them, the amount and the species that we use is very important to keep in mind. So, and yes, castrating is important uh, to get a good quality product. And yes, they don't bloom. Uh, here's when the bats end up losing. So maybe you wanna have a, a balance there to have some, you know, for the bats and some for us. <laughs> Listen, before time expires, I wanna get to the third mezcal. Let me, let me say, let me give the rundown on that one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of, of what a number of us have been able to do. Um, Todd Hanley from Hotel Congress, Paco Cantu, who's with us tonight, Borderlands writer, um, Felipe Garcia from Visit Tucson, and, and me from El Crisol. Um, we have brought in a little bit of a really great, I mean, brought into Arizona, imported to Arizona or facilitated the importation of a really great mezcal project called uh, Nacion de las Verdes Matas, which is headquartered in, in Monterrey, Nuevo León, um, led by uh, an amazing guy called Luis Loya, Hugo Gonzalez, who, like I said at the sort of the outset, is is a US representative of that particular project. He's with us tonight too. Um, as a Borderlands resident, I'm really interested in Northern Mescals. And so that's, that's one of the reasons I was, I was passionate about participating in this project. And the one that we're showcasing tonight is a Masparillo from the state of Durango, it's from Mesquital, um, made by a master named Felipe Soto, who's a Tepewan Native American, Tepewan um, producer. 
Uh, Mesquital is south of Durango City. It's so it's southern Durango. It's sort of in this zone between sort of bordering Nayarit and Jalisco and, and Durango, that zone. And it's made from Agave Maximiliana, which is harvested wild. It grows wild on canyon slopes. Um, I wish we had photos. I can't really show you photos, but uh, it's also, that's an agave that's also found pretty commonly in the Western Sierra of the state of Jalisco uh, and used to make ricea in that part of Mexico. Um, it's pretty low in sugar, so the yield isn't very high. So the, the, the lots or, or the batches tend to be pretty small. So here you go, this is like 40, 40 to 200 liters or something like that. Amor Mata is, is, can you just say once, just a couple of words about that? Because it's really, you know, I love the projects that are working with masters that are, and are producing just tiny batches. So they're quite, quite precious commodities in a way, right? So that's, that's basically, right, Hugo, what it is, 40 to 200 liters. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Uh, let me check that. This one uh, in specific was uh, 40, 40 liters batch. Yeah, yeah. Really, Only? Really, really small. Yeah. Um, produced in, you know, generally this, the same way that many, many, many artisanal mezcals are made. So cooked in a conical pit oven underground, milled by, by axe and then by a shredding machine, uh, fermented in pine lined, sometimes they're called coffins um, as, as a sort of um, um, well, they're called coffins because these are, the fermentation tanks are in the ground. They tend to be rectangular. They're lined with pine. Um, so Philippe or Jesus showed you uh, an underground, he called them barrancos, barrancos, these underground fermentation tanks in the Sonoran case, sort of the same principle, underground, but pine lined and in rectangles, um, fermented in, in, in that sort of a system and distilled in copper or copper ollas with what's called a viejo, which is the top chamber of the still or what's called the Montera in Oaxaca, what's sometimes called the sombrero in Sonora, in, in Sonora the top chamber of the still is wood. So Jesus also showed you some wood sombreros. Um, it's called viejo apparently because the trees that are used for that part of the still are very old. Viejo means old. So that appears to be the reason they're called viejos. And this is a mezcal. It's, it's, it's maybe the hottest one uh, of, of the group tonight, meaning that it's sort of highest in ABV. This one's 49% ABV, whereas the other ones are in the case of Bacanora, 45%. In the case of the Sotol, 47%. We're still above 90 proof here, guys. So that tends to be the way we go with artisanal Sotols and Mezcals. Um, this one's 49. And I find this to be a very, very lovely Mezcal. It's really green. It's vegetal. It's herbal. There's nice green pepper notes and spearmint notes in it. It's really warm on the finish, so it's a great winter mezcal, I find. Black pepper on the finish. And somebody mentioned in a review of this mezcal that this is like, imagine, because it's smoky too, of course, as, as a lot of these spirits are, but imagine sort of a like a, a, a burn landscape. And this is the first green, like the first colonizing plants after a forest fire coming out. And so there's this really fresh young green expression that's coming out of kind of an ashy substrate, right? And I think that's a really good description of this mezcal. It's, it's very, very fine. So um, yeah, that's my description of this mezcal. I just wanted to make sure that we got that in before we, we moved on with the discussion for those who purchased it and wanted some commentary on it. All right.
Ben, you have a question, right? You said, you yeah. yeah, let's hear it. Cool. So Jesus, this is kind of a nomenclature question. Um, and I guess there's two parts of it. You can feel free to go whatever direction you want. One is the use of the term mezcal, often para, spelled M-E-S-C-A-L, like you showed the mezcal bacanora. And Wendy, in her talk, talked about uh, mezcal agaves from Baja California. And I'm curious when the word mezcal is paired with agave, or it's like used very specifically for the plant, or a plant itself. And it seems to be a clear distinction from the beverage. But then the mezcal bacanora label that was you know, produced here in the early 1900s in Tucson seems a little different. So that's the first part of the question. The second is when you talk about lechuguilla down, and I know that term from spirits down in like the Sinaloa, Alamos, Chihuahua, Sonora corner there in the mountains. And I love the idea of that, you know, lechuguilla means a smaller plant, but those agave bobicarnutas uh, that is produced from can get quite large. So I'm just curious if that was just started with a smaller species and then has been kind of appropriated to other larger ones. Um, so a totally two-party question, but wherever you want to go. Yes, totally. Uh, I mean, I mentioned briefly at the beginning, I don't know if you saw that, the, the concept of mezcal just being a cooked agave, period. Uh, you know, from Nahuatl language describing a cooked agave. Uh, what you could do with that cooked agave is your business. Whether you eat it, you uh, maybe extract some syrup, uh, maybe dry it uh, and eat it like jerky or like uh, Wendy and Juicy mentioned the other day, you mush them into little cakes and store it for like carne seca, kind of like carne machaca sort of thing. Um, but it's agave, it's cooked agave. And but again, I think we're getting more into the linguistic realm of uh, using common names to describe things. Uh, my father would just, would always say, uh, he would, they wouldn't even use the word mezcal, they use the word pisto. Uh, vamos a hacer pisto. Pisto, and then you go to South America or Spain, pisto means something completely different. But uh, many Sonorans refer to any spirits as pisto, mezcal, or trago, as we say. When you say, ¿Quieres un trago? That doesn't mean water. So all this vocabulary uh, has meanings, regional uh, meanings in many ways. And yes, uh, many botanists uh, found out that, uh, oh, what is the name of this plant? So often they would ask the locals, uh, oh, here we have a new agave that we haven't described in our inventory. So let's ask the locals. And they tell, what is it? Oh, mezcal, <laughs> we call it mezcal. And the local may not be able to tell the difference between one species and another because they know, oh, yeah, we make mezcal with that. And that's what we call it, we call it mezcal but it is a completely different species from the other one that somebody else already told you is called mezcal. Those common names float around. And <laughs> so, and, and the same thing with lechuguilla. Lechuguilla essentially means any small agave. How small? I don't know. It could be very small, the size of a, you know, of a lettuce. Uh, to palmeri, agave palmeri, they can be quite big, almost twice as big as a large murphyi but there's still lechuguilla. So it doesn't qualify as maguey, uh, as bacanora down in central Sonora. It's regional, linguistically regional. And, and then in between you have botanists uh, naming things based on the local things. And then in many cases, again, I'm not hitting on you, Ben, but I mean, uh, uh, botanists who, uh, uh, in some cases, um, botanists uh, who have translators or trying to figure out how that spell. I, I've been dealing so much for so many years at the Desert Museum, uh, sometimes translating names of plants. People want to know, okay, what is the name of this plant in, in, in Spanish? And it has five different names. Uh, because in English, we tend to have very much specific names that sometimes correspond to scientific names. In Spanish, it's like rattlesnakes. It's a rattlesnake. What kind of rattlesnake? It doesn't matter, it's a rattlesnake. It's the same idea, it happens in plants as well, and it can be confusing. So it's experience, it's awareness, it's um, um, local experience, uh, tasting experience that really sometimes narrow down those details. <laughs> it is very fuzzy, sorry. <laughs> that was a fantastic answer, thank you. Another question um, from Todd. Uh, you know, we, you, you 
suggested, Jesus, that, you know, th there is a history of, of you know, this, of, of agave distillate production in Tucson, or at least north of the border. I've actually heard that, you know, the stills that, that made that, that Bacanora you, you, you showed that were, were hidden in the Santa Rita Mountains. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, but kind of in keeping with, with a current, it's not a controversy perhaps, but it's certainly a discussion about Sotol producers in the United States, right? Um, there is a Sotol denomination of origin too, which embraces the states of Chihuahua and Coahuila and Durango. Anybody producing a Sotol outside of those states, which many people do, can't be called Sotol because the law says no to that, right? So there is a certain um, claim to heritage that's geographically defined. Um, and so we're talking mainly about Mexican distillates and that sort of heritage. So, you know, what might be the politics of producing an agave distillate north of the border? I mean, if, if, if we resumed a project, say right here in Tucson, you know, what are the, what are the complications there? If any, maybe there aren't any complications, but what do you think? Did you hear that? You're muted, Jesus. Sorry, I'm sorry. Well, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, sorry, um, I was talking about. Well, somebody asked a question about whether it's it's okay for gringos to be producing agave distillates when you know the vast majority of the heritage of agave distillates resides in Mexico, right? What 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 are the kind of politics there? Interesting concept, of course. Uh, oh my gosh, uh, you were. Um... I think we lost Jesus. I think we lost Jesus. Oh, no. <laughs> the politics are too complex for him to talk about. He, is, it. he does not want to answer this question. <laughs> he ducked my answer. He ducked my question, Doug. <laughs> Well, I suppose we could invite responses from, from other folks too, right? Anybody have any comment about that? I mean, it's already being done, certainly. Uh, it's probably inevitable that it will be done. Uh, we're hearing news from, say, the Central Valley of California that because of water issues, there some farmers are replacing pecan trees or pecan orchards, not pecan, almonds, almond orchards with agave. That's typically tequila agaves. Um, so there's a lot of blue agave distillates that I think are in process in the US. They can't call themselves tequila because there's also a denomination of origin there. They'll call themselves something else, but it is an agave distillate, right? Um, and I think, you know, a, a number of us have talked about this because there does appear to be historical evidence that agave distillate production was happening in Tucson, um, certainly happening in the colonial period. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, and perhaps into the 20th century, uh, into the prohibition period, uh, or just prior to the prohibition period. And doubtless also during the prohibition period, there were plenty of stills making agave spirits in our region. But there's also, oh, there you are again. Sorry, Mike, I, I've been in Zoom meetings all day in my battery. <laughs> I was falling. I was stalling until we could get you back, Casey. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, so uh, that is a, that is an amazing question, though. And and I was just thinking, it kind of falls. I was even reading the paper uh, just in the last couple of days. I think it falls in the same story about how um, 
restaurants are popping up in, in the United States with these Mexican recipes, Mexican styles of food, Mexican tendencies that the influx of the culture of Mexico here, I mean, we have a, a, an overlapping uh, system of cultures here where this Anglo-Saxon culture living in the Southwest, if you wanna call it, or in this area, and then it's right there is Mexico where there's this other very uh, diverse culture and that influx of foods, ideas, culture, traditional knowledge is flowing over, over the border. And so, yes, we get into the realm of uh, um, when are we encroaching into um, um, this concept of stealing, you know, the culture or stealing the um, the rights of this other thing and then becomes commercial or not or it simply becomes artisanal. Uh, because you go back in time and everybody, every family were making their own um, drinks or their own um, ferments or their own. And it is a fuzzy line that then it goes into the legal realm and it's quite complicated, I think. Um, I think what's happening in Mexico overall, just to kind of quickly end here, um, the concept of mezcals becoming so popular, not just in the United States, but in Europe. I've been in, in Spain in some mezcalerias in, in, in Valencia, Spain, that they offer you 80 varieties of mezcal in Spain. And you wonder, well, I mean, and very expensive in Europe. So the, then you ask the question, what about the local people who are also are consumers of that, of that product? and it's part of their culture. So how can we balance this idea to um, give a, a, a space for, for the local people here or there and yet be able to enjoy that sustainably, uh, almost commercially sustain, sustainably? It's, 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 a, it's a hard question to answer. And I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I don't know what you guys discussed a little more about that, but. I was just reading the chat to see if there are more questions. Any, anybody have any burning questions that we need to have answered before we close tonight? Mm -hmm. And I think in the meantime, if people are, uh, we're looking at the questions, uh, one example would be, for instance, what's going on here in Tucson? Um, uh, again, this question for you, Doug, how can we support uh, El Crisol or your efforts and all the people that work with you during the pandemic and during these times where we're supporting these efforts, we're supporting this concept. And yet, how can we support the people in Mexico, the locals yeah. uh, who have that knowledge? Because one thing that I wanted to mention early on, which is very, very fascinating from the anthropological point of view, uh, sometimes you have um, uh, people who have the money to put up front to create a, 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 a vinata and, and maybe even create a label and export it anywhere. But always the vinatero or the maestro vinatero is gonna be a local person who probably has no education, often living in, in poor conditions, who has all that knowledge. And without him, yeah. you don't get that good mezcal. So, how can we balance that between, you know, a, a place where an outlet, uh, a person can enjoy these wonderful products, very products of very, very hard work, but also protect the culture and the traditional knowledge of those regions? Yeah, I just had a long conversation with Hugo Gonzalez about that today. Um, and that is the future, for sure. That's, that's the only viable future, I think, for, for this for this project, this industry. All right, guys. Thanks again so much, Jesus, for all the fine words. And thanks to you guys for attending. Uh, we'll see you again when, guy, when Ben, when's, when's the next one? March, which, where, sorry. Go to. Go to the, the, the right there, click the link in the chat, 11th of March. Okay, very good.
Well, thank you, everybody, well, thank you. and hopefully, uh, well, stay tuned. Uh, we might be able to um, have some of you probably in person and do something at the Mission Garden, uh, some roasting. If you've never experienced tasting agaves, we're working it. As you can see, there are some here uh, on cue to maybe do some roasting at the Mission Garden or eventually maybe at Tumamak, you never know. Uh, to be able to just have a firsthand taste of this uh, of this culture and uh, stay tuned. Um, something will happen. I think Ben, we were talking about maybe uh, between April and May, somewhere in there. So something will be happening and you get to have hopefully a close uh, experience of, of this process. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you.